Well, good morning. I am so excited to have the youth bands leading us in worship. I know that they have been practicing for so many months, and I am just so thankful that God has put us in a congregation where there's so many generations and we all serve together. And so this is a really exciting uh, gathering, but it's also Palm Sunday. And Palm Sunday has always been my favorite Sunday of the year. Now, it's hard to imagine the crowds that would have descended upon Jerusalem on that first Palm Sunday over 2,000 years ago. See, on a normal day, about 100,000 people would have called Jerusalem their home. But during Passover, the most important celebration in the Jewish calendar, the city would have grown to a population over 2.5 million people. You see, Passover was a date that was circled in every Jewish calendar. It was so important. No one would ever miss it. It was kind of like Easter or Christmas for us. Now, Passover was this week-long celebration where everything else would stop. People wouldn't go to school. They wouldn't go to work. There was no after-school activities, no soccer, no basketball. There was no after-hour meetings. All anyone would do would gather with their family and their friends, and they would eat delicious food. They would sing. They would dance. And their celebration centered around remembering when God had rescued their ancestors, their great, 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 great grandparents many years before. You see, there was this difficult season in the history where their ancestors had been forced to work as slaves in Egypt. And as slaves, they were treated horribly by the Egyptians and their ruler Pharaoh. They would have to wake up before the sun. They would have to make bricks out of dirt, and then they would have to use those bricks to build these massive buildings and statues for Egypt and for Pharaoh. All day, every day, under the hot, hot sun, with very little food or very little breaks. You see, their conditions were very oppressive. They felt trapped. They didn't know how to break free from the walls that were closing in on them. And so for years, the Hebrew people would call out to God. And they would ask God to help them. They would say, God, send us a rescuer to free us from Egypt. And the Bible says that God hears their cries. And God chooses a man named Moses to rescue his people. You see, God raises Moses up and he sends Moses to Pharaoh. And he demands that God's people be allowed to leave. But at first, Pharaoh says no. He won't let God's people go. So God helps Moses to convince Pharaoh by sending awful plagues upon Egypt. Now, these plagues were brutal. Their water was turned into blood. Flies swarmed through the air that they couldn't even see when they were walking. Darkness filled their skies so that they couldn't ever see the light. Their animals died. Many people died. But God protected his people by causing the final plague, which was the worst plague of them all, to pass over the people of God. And that's why they call the celebration Passover, because the plague of death had passed over the homes of God's people and it had not harmed them. And so eventually this final plague actually leads Pharaoh to agree to let the people of God go. And so God uses Moses to lead the people out of Egypt and into this new land where they are no longer slaves. And so ever since then, every year, the people of God have celebrated Passover where they take time to remember what God did for their ancestors. And they also remember the promises that God made for their future. And though you can celebrate Passover anywhere, we could celebrate it here today, the best place to celebrate Passover was Jerusalem because that's where God's temple was. And that's why over 2.5 million people would travel to Jerusalem to celebrate Passover with their family and their friends for seven days. Now, 2.5 million people, that's a lot of people. It's really hard for us to even understand the largeness of this crowd. The best example that I could probably think of happened back in 2019 when the Raptors won the NBA Finals and millions of people came to our city to participate in the victory parade, celebrating that the Raptors had made history with their historic NBA 
championship. See, on that day, sources estimate that between one to two million people swelled the parade route in the hopes of catching a glimpse of the Raptors, while another 100,000 people crowded into Nathan Phillips Square, squeezing into whatever space they could possibly find to just experience the magic and the energy of the moment. See, Toronto was full of people on that day who wanted to celebrate, and as prepared as our city tried to be for this moment in history, well, the amount of people that squeezed into our city to celebrate was even larger than they could have ever predicted. And this is a moment that Raptors fans will never, ever forget. Now, another large crowd is predicted to descend on our city later this year when Taylor Swift's tour bus pulls into Toronto and she makes history as the first artist to ever perform six sold out shows at the Rogers Centre. See, experts are predicting that this will be the biggest impact any artist has ever had in Toronto over 10 days. See, from the moment she announced her Toronto tour date, Swifties have marked their calendars and they've begun frantically searching for these coveted tickets. If you're a parent, you're gonna understand the disappointment that came when you weren't able to secure those tickets for your kids. And because most people actually couldn't secure the tickets, Experts are actually predicting that in addition to the 300,000 people that are come, gonna come to Toronto for those sold out shows, we're actually gonna see thousands of more people descend on the city to try and be part of the experience of Taylor coming to Toronto. And as massive as these record-breaking crowds were, they actually pale in comparison to what Jerusalem would have seen during Passover. See, Taylor's gonna grow our city's population by about 15% when she comes. The Raptors parade actually grew our city's population by 50% on that day. But on the first Palm Sunday during Passover, experts say Jerusalem's population was about 2,300% more than the regular normal day. And something happened a few days earlier that would have made that crowd really excited and really charged up, almost as if someone had shaken a pot bottle and they were ready to undo the lid and let it pop. See, Jesus had done something a few days earlier that made people really excited and some people really upset. And everyone was talking about what Jesus had done. See, so often I think we think of the Palm Sunday story as starting when Jesus rides into Jerusalem on a donkey, don't we? But actually, the story takes place in a place called Bethany. That's where our story starts. Now, Bethany is the home of some of Jesus' best friends. There's two sisters. They're named Mary and Martha, and they have a brother named Lazarus. And one day, Lazarus becomes sick. So Mary and Martha, they send for their friend Jesus because they know that Jesus loves Lazarus and their hearts are broken and they feel like Jesus might be able to help. But Lazarus dies before Jesus can get to Bethany. And Lazarus has actually been dead for four days before Jesus arrives at their house. But something miraculous happens when Jesus shows up. See, Jesus shows up and he says, take me to Lazarus' grave. And so Jesus, along with a crowd of people that follow him, they're probably thinking there's going to be some sort of memorial or funeral service. They all go to the grave. But instead of holding a funeral for Lazarus, Jesus looks into the tomb and he calls out and he says, Lazarus, come out. Well, the crowd watches in amazement as Lazarus, who has been dead for four days, walks out of the grave. Well, you can imagine what happens next. The news spreads like wildflower that this very important teacher, Jesus, has raised a dead man back to life after four days. And now there's two groups of people that are sharing this news. The first group of people, the Bible says, some people saw what Jesus had done and they chose to believe him. See, they immediately followed him when they found out that Jesus had raised a dead man back to life. But the Bible says that some others went to the important religious leaders and they told them what Jesus had done. And these important religious leaders that the Bible's talking about, they already don't like Jesus. And they make this plan to go ahead and kill him. And they make an announcement to everyone, especially the people who are in Jerusalem, that if anybody sees Jesus, 
They are to report Jesus so that he can be arrested and stopped. And so for a few days, the Bible tells us that Jesus stays inside with his disciples. But something changes because the Bible says, until the time of the Jewish Passover. You see, when Passover arrives, rumors start to swirl around, wondering if Jesus is going to head to Jerusalem. On one hand, it makes complete sense for Jesus to go there. See, Jesus was Jewish. He would have celebrated the Passover his whole life. Jesus is also a Jewish teacher now, and so people would assume he would go to Jerusalem to celebrate Passover. But on the other hand, because so many people are on the hunt for Jesus, it could probably make sense to skip it this year, right? Like, I can imagine his disciples saying, you know what, Jesus, why don't we just not go? Why don't we celebrate Passover where we are, hidden inside of a house, safe? And Jesus is probably like, no, I'm going to Jerusalem. And they're like, okay, Jesus, no problem. Why don't we find a way through a back gate, maybe, in a quiet little way? We'll, we'll go into Jerusalem and we'll celebrate, but let's not let anyone know that they're there. See, if I was Jesus, and I knew the risk of heading into Jerusalem where thousands of people were looking for me, I'd probably choose to stay safe and continue the work of God by quietly helping my followers learn how to follow God so that they could still follow God, but I would stay safe in a house. But the bravery of Jesus is so inspiring to me because, friends, love is brave. Each of us have experienced moments when we're scared, where the easier thing to do is just to stay quiet, particularly when it has to do with telling anybody about God or a better faith. I remember when I was a kid, and the topic of God would come up, maybe in my classroom or with my friends, and I just wanted to hide, I remember. I just wanted the conversation to stop. I remember just wanting everyone to stop talking about it because everybody knew that I went to church. And it's a scary thing to try and choose to be brave and tell everyone that I'm a follower of Jesus. Well, now I'm a pastor, so you would think this comes easier to me, right? But even I, at times, try to avoid conversations of faith with people because I know they're going to think differently of me when they know that I follow Jesus. See, it's hard to be brave when there's a personal cost involved. But Jesus, he models bravery for us in this moment because love is always brave. It always puts others' needs before our own. See, Jesus knows that there's people in Jerusalem who actually need to know that God loves them. And so he goes, even though he's likely going to experience pain by going there. So when people hear confirmation that Jesus is headed to Jerusalem, half the people are eagerly waiting to see Jesus. They're excited. They want to follow him. The other half of the people, well, they want to be the ones to find Jesus and report it to the authorities because there's probably some sort of reward or, or prestige involved in that. So they're excited to see Jesus too. And even though Jesus understands that nobody else really understands him, and although he knows that he's probably going to be arrested if he heads to Jerusalem, and even though he knows that Jerusalem is actually a path directly to the cross, Jesus heads to Jerusalem. He walks towards the people who want to arrest him. Because love compels Jesus to just keep doing everything that he already has been doing. Serving others. Healing others. Healing brokenness. Defending the oppressed. Rebuking the oppressors. Teaching about God. Encouraging the discouraged. And challenging the religious leaders. And so instead of slipping quietly into Jerusalem, Jesus walks towards the city. And as, we, as he does, we read in the Bible that a large crowd begins to form, and they prepare to greet him. Reading from Luke chapter 19, verses 28 to 40. Jesus went on ahead, going up to Jerusalem. As they came close, he sent two of the disciples on ahead. Go into the village over there, he said, and as you arrive, you'll find a colt tied up, one that nobody has ever ridden. Untie it and bring it here. If anyone says to you, why are you untying it? You should say, because the master needs it. The two who were sent went off and found it, just as Jesus had said to them. They brought it to Jesus, 
threw their cloaks on the colt and mounted Jesus on it. As he was going along, people kept spreading their cloaks on the road. When he came to the descent of the Mount of Olives, the whole crowd of disciples began to celebrate and praise God at the tops of their voices for all the powerful deeds they have seen. Welcome, welcome, welcome with a blessing, they sang. Welcome to the King in the name of the Lord. Peace in heaven and glory on high. Some of the Pharisees from the crowd said to Jesus, Teacher, tell your disciples to stop that. Let me tell you, replied Jesus. If they stayed silent, the stones would be shouting out. This is the word of the Lord. Great job, Lorenz. Well, I want you to imagine how the energy, it's easy to do that now that our kids have, have showed us, but how the energy of the crowd must have grown as they shouted, Hosanna, welcome the king, catching sight of Jesus riding into a, the city of Jerusalem. See, for days, everyone had been on the watch for Jesus. If they had social media back then, there would have been conspiracy theories, there would have been questions, there would have been opinions swirling around TikTok. There probably would have been AI produced pictures of Jesus. The paparazzi probably was hiding in the bushes waiting to catch a glimpse of Jesus to sell to the papers. I'm sure TMZ would have been trying to secure video footage of Jesus as he headed to the market. Everybody would have been on the lookout posting and weighing in as to where Jesus was and why no one had seen him in days. Oh yeah, we're going to build that wall, okay? Yeah, okay, we'll get to that in just a moment. See, finally, after days of silence, there was Jesus entering Jerusalem during one of the most prominent celebrations in the Jewish calendar. So the crowd was excited. They were in the middle of celebrating Passover, a time where they were already remembering themselves, how faithful God had been to their ancestors, but also remembering the promises that God had given them for the future. See, during the Passover celebrations, as they sat around and ate food around with their, with their families, they would have recalled the promises that God had made to them about the future. And one of the promises that they would have recalled, one of the promises that they would have actually probably memorized as children and would have shared around those tables was a promise that Moses had actually been given by God. And it's from Deuteronomy 18, and it says this, God will raise up another prophet who is even greater than me. And you're gonna know it's him because everything that he says will actually come true. And of course, the crowd who's gathered to welcome Jesus, they've either actually seen or heard how Jesus raised a dead man after four days and how Lazarus had indeed gotten out of that tomb and walked out on his own. See, for so long, the Jewish people had been waiting for God to send the Messiah who would fulfill the prophecies that God had given. And Jesus of Nazareth was actually fulfilling every prophecy that had been given. So it's no wonder they were excited to welcome Jesus into Jerusalem. You see, they were anticipating that this Messiah would be like an earthly king, and that this Messiah would actually do what Moses had done. Moses had freed them from opposition in Egypt. They were hoping that this Messiah that God would send would actually free them for the, from the oppression that they were currently experiencing. See, they were anticipating a great battle and a great victory to happen when Jesus walked into Jerusalem. The truth is that the cross would have been the furthest thing from their minds, which is so interesting why Jesus chose to show up on a donkey. See, there's so much symbolism here to Jesus riding on a donkey. We could, we could just talk about that all day. It's a great study if you have a community group to maybe look at this week. Why did Jesus come to Jerusalem on a donkey? Two things I want to show you today why I think Jesus came to Jerusalem on the donkey. The first is that by riding on a donkey, well, Jesus was simply fulfilling a prophecy. In Zechariah 9.9, God instructs that one day he would send the Messiah to them with this instruction. O people of Jerusalem, look, your king is going to come to you. He's going to be righteous. He's going to be victorious. And he's going to be humble, 
riding on a donkey. Now, I love the way the message translation writes this verse. It says this, Jerusalem, your king is coming. He is a good king, and he's going to make everything right. He's going to be a humble king, and he's going to ride on a donkey. There will be no more war. No more war horses, no more swords, no more spears, no more bows or arrows. This king is going to offer peace to the nation and a peaceful rule to the world. See, a donkey would have sent quite a different message to the people. It would have confirmed that Jesus was indeed the promised Messiah because he was fulfilling the promise of riding in on a donkey. Pastor Steph, this is sure surprising and unexpected. Are you okay? You're good? Okay, yeah, you're good too. We could, this girl needs some water. Now, is, this is very unexpected because I didn't know you had a pet donkey. Uh, she's not mine. This is not your pet? She's, no, no. Do you want to keep it? Uh, Take it home? She's a little feisty. Okay, I can tell. So I'm not sure. Does she have a name? Her name is Tiffany. Tiffany. So <laughs> Tiffany, it's great to meet you, Tiffany. Thank you. It's a hi. Everyone say hi, Tiffany. Hi, hi Tiffany. Now, Tiffany is a donkey or a colt, like yes. Loren read for us. This is unexpected because we thought she would come out nicely, but that didn't we did. happen. We did. We thought she'd come out just Which with a breeze. It's actually helpful because we're talking about Pastor Steph, how Jesus came as a king and he was very unexpected. He did unexpected things. Right. And so I'm wondering, now that I have you up here, yeah. maybe you could tell me about, has there ever been a time in your life that something really unexpected happened. Like, I know this, but yeah. anything else? I, well, I wasn't expecting her to give me such nope. a fight. Yeah. But, um, I, yeah, I can think of one. I think, actually, it would probably be um, a moment that happened at summer camp. Okay. Here. Um, I was on the hill, and I was pretty sure that I was going to win this, uh, this, this um, race. I was running. I would have put all my money on you. Yeah, thank you're you. a really good runner. Yes. Okay. And so I was running, and I, um, oh. well, I, oh, you've got it right there. Yep. I, I took a bit of a tumble. You fell down the hill. I did fall down. There, there I am. Oh. Yeah. I. And you expected to I win. Tumble, I really thought I was gonna win, and you can see some kids coming to my aid. I yeah. wasn't expecting to fall. And tumble down the hill. Okay. Yes. Okay. You know yes. what? This is kind of how the people would have felt when Jesus came to Jerusalem. Actually, when he came to the world. Because Jesus did things that were completely unexpected. Like, people would have expected him to show up in a palace. Yeah. Instead, Jesus shows up in a stinky manger. Mm. Uh, people would have expected Jesus maybe to live, like, a lavish life of luxury, like, in that palace as a prince. No, instead, Jesus works with his hands mm. as a carpenter. And you know what? People would have expected that Jesus, maybe he'd come on like a big, beautiful horse. Instead, he uh, showed up on something a donkey, like, which would like have this. been surprising. Not my choice. See, instead of coming and swinging a sword into Jerusalem to be the rightful king that he is, Jesus comes and he actually washes people's feet. Mm. And as Jesus rides into Jerusalem on a donkey, the people actually would have been, wow, their eyes would have been open. Because back then, if a king wanted to come to a city and he was ready to like wage a war, he would show up on a magnificent, beautiful, large horse hmm. so that everybody was impressed by his horse. But if a king wanted to come into a city and offer peace, well, he would choose to ride on his donkey because that would symbolize for everybody else that he was coming in peace and he wanted to restore the relationship that had been broken. It's really cool, Pastor Jessica. Yeah. Jesus came not as we would have expected. No. He didn't come like a normal king, which is such a cool illustration. Well, I'm going to attempt okay. to take Tiffany backstage. Good luck. Thank you so much. And uh, kids, Tiffany and some of her other friends are going to be in the self lobby after the gathering. So you're, no, you're not going to want to miss it. You're going to come on out and you can see some of her and her friends. All okay. right. Good luck. Everyone say good luck, Pastor Steph. Okay, let's see. Bye, Tiffany. Come on, girl. <laughs> she's, she's very strong. I'd help you, but... <laughs> okay. Come on, girl. <laughs> she's very strong. <laughs> but you're stronger, Pastor Steph. Okay. But you are stronger there than you. Tiffany. <laughs> okay.
You know what, friends? The thing about Tiffany, the donkey, that's similar to Jesus is that Jesus always did things that were unexpected or different from the way that probably we would choose to do them. In fact, Jesus does something so surprising on that Palm Sunday that sometimes we even forget that it's a part of the story. The Bible tells us that as Jesus came into Jerusalem, he looks over the city and he begins to weep. He says, how I wish today that all of the people could understand the way to peace, but now it's too late because peace has been hidden from their eyes. Before long, your enemies will break down your walls and encircle you and close you in on every side. They're gonna crush you to the ground. Your enemies are not gonna leave a single stone in place because you did not recognize it when God visited you. See, what a juxtaposition this is. We have this crowd that's full of joy and exuberance celebrating as Jesus comes into Jerusalem. But here is Jesus looking over the city and he's weeping with grief and pain as he considers the people who are against him. Friends, Jesus came to this broken world to restore his broken people back into relationship with him. God had hoped that the people of Jerusalem, his chosen people, would actually be a light to the world and point creation back to its creator. You see, Jerusalem had been designed as a city on a hill with a temple in the middle so that they would be a beacon of light for everyone. But they failed at this mission. They failed to live up to the role that God had designed them for, to be a lighthouse for the world. So this is why Jesus is crying. This is why he's lamenting, why he says, how I wish that you could understand the way to peace because your enemies are gonna come and they're gonna break down your walls because you didn't recognize that I was living among you. See, these are beautiful recorded moments for us, such beautiful examples of the strength of love because love is both strong and gentle. Jesus could have ridden in on a big, beautiful horse, ready for battle, show the world that he was the true and righteous king, and all of that would have been true. But Jesus didn't come on a war horse because Jesus didn't come to conquer anybody. Jesus rode on a donkey because he had humbled himself, had taken on our humanity, and he had declared peace with a plan to restore the relationship that had been broken with people. You see, here we have Jesus looking over Jerusalem, no doubt he's thinking about the enemies who are already plotting against him, making plans for his execution. Here Jesus models the strength of his love as he weeps, not for himself, not for the cross ahead, but in this moment, Jesus is overcome with love for his creation. He's weeping because his creation is going to reject their Messiah. Friends, Jesus' mind is always on us. He's always thinking about you. See, the creator of the universe, this greatest strong force in all of history, he weeps at the thought of a future that's not with you. Everything that Jesus did from arriving as an infant to coming on a donkey, everything was because of us. It was a declaration and demonstration of the strength and the gentleness of Jesus' love for us. See, it was love that compelled Jesus to go towards Jerusalem, even though the personal cost would be greater than you and I could ever comprehend. This next song that we're gonna sing, it talks about Jesus' response to our great love for us. The truth is that just as Jerusalem missed the mark, sometimes I miss the mark. I wonder if sometimes you miss the mark too. Sometimes I don't live in a way that declares that the creator of the world and the king of my heart actually came to restore peace between me and God. Yet this is what I found. God continually draws me. He continually calls me back to him, continuing to declare peace over my life. Well, friends, we all have a tendency of building walls, don't we? Humanity is great at building walls. We build them for all different kinds of reasons all kinds of purposes. Some of us build walls to protect ourselves and our hard-earned stuff. Some of us build walls to protect others, those who we love, to keep them safe. Some people build walls to keep those who are different from us away from us. Some people build walls to keep uh, so we can hide 
behind them because we feel safe when there's a wall around us. Some people build walls to avoid the pain of the past or any pain that could ever come in the future. If you're a parent, you've probably felt the temptation to build walls around your children. We tell ourselves it's for their benefit to protect them, but oftentimes it's out of fear or it's out of control that we start to erect up a wall brick by brick. At first it feels safe, especially when this wall is so well built that it's impenetrable. But the problem comes when we realize that by building up such a high, strong wall, you end up on one side and those who you love end up on the other side. The truth is that walls break relationships and separate us from each other. And building walls was exactly what the religious leaders were doing. When they heard about Jesus of Nazareth healing people, sitting down with tax collectors, befriending prostitutes, raising dead men from their graves, the religious leaders started building up walls between them and Jesus. And they worked hard to build walls between Jesus and everyone else. He's a heretic, they would say. He's breaking the Sabbath, they'd say, when Jesus had compassion healed people on the holy day. He's speaking against Moses, they would say, trying to discredit Jesus. And these are the same tactics that the religious leaders have been using for years. Follow all the rules, and then maybe we'll consider letting you in. Make one mistake, you're going to be cast out forever. And these religious leaders were especially skilled at building up walls as they ran the temple. You see, their job at the temple was actually to help people build a relationship with God. They were supposed to be a bridge between God and the people, but instead, they had turned the temple into an impossible place to access God. See, they had added so many fees to the temple. They added a fee to enter the temple. Then they added a fee to wash your hands so that you were clean to keep going into the temple. They added a fee to secure an appropriate sacrifice. They added a fee so that they would speak a blessing over that sacrifice. They even added a fee so that they could offer the sacrifice to God. See, the religious leaders had introduced so many fees, so many rules, so many policies at the temple that the majority of people could no longer come to the temple because they couldn't afford it or they didn't qualify. And this is why Jesus looks over Jerusalem and he weeps because the city of God, the city that God had ordained to be a lighthouse to the world had become a place for religious leaders to become rich and erect walls that were impenetrable for the common person. And so after Jesus enters Jerusalem on that first Palm Sunday, we read that he heads straight to the temple. Now, this is a bold move because the religious leaders who want to arrest Jesus, they're obviously at the temple. It's a bold move because that's where everyone wants to be. They want to be at the temple. The crowd is there. It's also a bold move because it's exactly where everyone is expecting that he would want to go. But something very unexpected happens next. You see, everyone watches in amazement as Jesus, who already is a wanted man by everyone, enters the temple. And he looks around at all the tables that have been set up to collect all these money and these fees, and Jesus begins to overturn the tables, we're told, that have been set up that stop people from coming freely into the temple. And Jesus looks at the religious leaders who want to arrest him already, and he says, God's temple was built as a house of prayer, but you have turned it in to a den of thieves. See, Jesus was saying, you've erected so many obstacles and so many walls between God and his people. It's impossible for his people to come to the temple to meet with God. See, you have turned God's temple into a market where you could get rich. You've turned God's family into an exclusive for purchase only opportunity. And enough is enough. And as Jesus tears down those tables, what he's actually doing is he's symbolically tearing down the walls that kept the people 
out, that kept the people from having relationship with God. See, Jesus was declaring that anyone who wants to be in is now welcomed in the temple, and they're welcomed into the family of God. This was a radical life of love that Jesus lived. It was so different than the religious leaders had chosen to live. And that was so comforting. And it was so attractive to those of the people who had been on the wrong side of the wall for so very long. For the first time, many people on the outs of society were actually finally being embraced into community because of Jesus's life. And as Jesus overturns the temple, he models for us that a life of love includes. A life of love breaks down walls by welcoming and including everyone. Friends, I told you earlier about two groups of people who responded to Jesus raising Lazarus from the dead. The first group of people, well, they believed. They saw what happened. They responded to the love of Jesus. They chose to follow him, and they were waiting on the streets of Jerusalem to welcome him. The second group of people, well, they openly opposed Jesus. They plotted in silence to silence Jesus. They made a plan to arrest him. But there's one group of people that I did not mention who I imagine were actually there, the indifferent crowd. The crowd of people who recognized that there was an indeed a miracle that had happened. A dead man had walked out of the grave. They recognized that Jesus had done it, but instead of truly believing him or even following him, they probably just went on with their everyday lives. And I think this is the most dangerous group of them all. Those who have experienced Jesus, but that experience doesn't impact their everyday lives. And if I'm honest, I've actually found myself identifying with this group of people sometimes, of following Jesus, but not actually allowing my relationship with him to impact the other lives that are around me, of staying silent instead of sharing the good news of who Jesus is and what he has done. You see, the reason that Jesus raised Lazarus from the dead was not for his sisters, and it was not for Lazarus, even though Jesus loved them all. The reason Jesus raised Lazarus from the dead was so that many could see the power of God, and they rec could recognize Jesus was the Messiah, and that could impact their lives. Friends, Jesus did not journey to the cross on his own. Instead, he invited people to join him, to journey towards the cross together because love includes. And Jesus invites us to include as well. You see, if Jesus was standing here right now, I think his question might be to us, who can I love this Easter? Who can I take to the cross with me? Friends, let's not be like the religious leaders. Let's not build a wall between our faith and the rest of the world. Instead, let's be like Jesus. Let's take people with us as we journey towards Easter and as we journey towards the cross. And what might happen if we decide to do that is we need to consider the walls that might need to be broken down so that our light might help others come to Jesus too.